sending volunteers out to our local partners on second Saturday service for Birmingham, packaging and giving away gift bags to 500 local teachers this past December and January is for Birmingham. Funding 13 local and global partners with monthly financial support is for Birmingham. Hosting the Vestavia School System meetings at our facility is for Birmingham. Letting local rec basketball teams practice in our gym is for Birmingham. Sponsoring a free movie night in a community park is for Birmingham. Giving a shout out to a local business on social media with hashtag 4BHM is for Birmingham. Hosting a blood drive is for Birmingham. Being a voting precinct is for Birmingham. Cutting your neighbor's grass is for Birmingham. Giving away full-size candy bars to trick-or-treaters with a card that says God loves you is for Birmingham. Partnering with other churches is for Birmingham. Welcoming the ladybugs of Birmingham to our screen <laughs> is for the ladybugs of Birmingham. And all those are important and wonderful and impactful, and we're probably going to keep doing them all and coming up with more creative ways to get outside of our walls and be for Birmingham, but none of them are the most important thing we do for Birmingham. Good morning. My name is Carter McKinnis. I'm lead pastor here at Mountaintop, and I want to tell you that the most important thing we do for the city outside of our walls doesn't even happen outside of our walls. The most critical thing that happens for our city that we do, and, and this is the whole point of today's message that I want to tell you before we even dive into the scripture, at the risk of losing you, but you've got to promise to stick with me. What happens inside these walls has the potential to change the world outside these walls because people's lives are changed in here. Jim Saya's life was changed right here. And there's a Bible study happening at a business outside these walls because of what happened in here. Because here's, here's what I want you to know. It's people, not churches, not organizations, not ministries. People can change the world. And when God changes people in here, it has the potential to change the world for God out there. See, the most important thing, the most important thing we do for Birmingham is change more lives in Birmingham. That's it. The most important thing that we do for our city, for the city outside of our walls that did not even consider going to church today. They didn't even cross their mind. They haven't even considered about the impact that God might have in their life or God's plan for their life. It's just not even on their radar. The most important thing we do for our city is change more lives in Birmingham to connect more people to Jesus so that they might connect with those outside the walls. Because here's what I believe. If we will change more people for Birmingham, we can change more lives in Birmingham. We can change our city, and one more changed city can change the world. And this is critical in an initiative like the four campaign, understanding this, because it can, it can feel like we are building a building for us to make mountaintops name great. You can go out and look at all those pictures in the atrium, and I hope you have. I hope they inspire you. I hope they get you excited. But like you can have this like feeling of like, is, is, this, just about, is this just about us? Now, logistically, we need, we need some, some more and better facilities if we're going to invite and equip more people to follow Jesus. We need space for their cars. We need space for their children, space to disciple their teenagers. But it can feel like it's all about getting people in here, and here's the rub. This is the tension, the tightness you feel in your heart when you're ever, when you're ever part of like a campaign, and maybe this is the first time you've ever been a part of one. It's like, is this just about getting bigger? Is this just about ego? Is this just about numbers? And those are, those are really good questions. And, and, then, and then there's this idea that being for Birmingham is really what we do out in the community. And certainly, our vision for the next three years includes reaching out, serving our city, reaching out to the world outside beyond our walls. And we have some great opportunities coming up. 
We have a serve day, citywide serve day, on April 15th, the Saturday after Easter, where we are going to send hundreds of people to all kinds of different, to our local partners, to all kinds of places all across the city. I hope you'll be a part of it. We want everyone in the church to go out and love on our city. We have mission trips coming up this uh, year to Costa Rica, to Alaska, to the Dominican Republic. We want to be for the world. I, we have a heart. I have a heart to connect with, with local churches, to unite with yo- local churches. I just have a dream one day that we will have a, a night of prayer and worship for the city on behalf of the city. It is hard to get churches and pastors together. I have a dream. We're going we're to do it one day. We have a heart and ideas for how we want to reach out to business leaders in the community so that we can invest in them, so that we can encourage them. We are exploring what communities we feel the Lord might be leading us to to plant campuses on the edges of our city. And we want to gradually increase support to all of those local partners that you heard Jake talk about if you were here at the beginning. 13 non-local partners, four global partners. We want to continue giving more money away to them. So I'm telling you that to say that I am all for getting outside the walls. But because we have been trained to think that way in the church about missions, that missions is all about what happens in our, outside the walls, that missions is all about uh, what goes on out there and what we do out in our community, we can begin to feel this tension when we start thinking about building a building on our campus. Because then here's the big question, right? And so a few weeks ago we, we mentioned this. Part of our campaign is that $10.5 million will be our budget for the next three years. That's, we, we'll average over the next three years about $3.5 million a year. Um, that's what we feel like the, our, our average. So if we don't do any campaign, this is what we're going to spend on ministry. That's just, that's just what we do. And this construction project is $9.5 million, and this is what we can begin thinking. Man, what if... Instead of like building the building, we gave $9.5 million to missions. What if, if we did a $9.5 million serve day in Birmingham? That'd be something. Chris Connor, our missions pastor, would be super excited. I'm not sure we could come up with enough. $9.5 million to spend. What, what if, why don't we do something outside the walls instead of building literally more walls? Why don't we do something out there? And this is common, and we all think this, because we have all been trained to think about this way, uh, missions this way in the church. And it's a, those are great questions. Why not go spend money out there to reach? And this is why clarity is so important around this. And here's what I want to clarify before we read a story about the early church. Okay? Here's what I want to clarify, why this is so important. Church, we are the mission. Jim Say is sitting right there with his wife and his adopted daughter. I was at their wedding and she read a letter asking him to adopt her. That is the mission. We, we can go out and we can go help all of our partners and we can rake yards and we can go paint walls and we're going to do that and we're going to help organizations that are doing great things in our city. We are called to serve as followers. That is the mission. Sometimes people ask me the question, how much does your church spend on missions? And here's what my answer. Every dime because this is the mission. What we do is the mission. All of this that we spend on our budget every single week is the mission. Now, here's what people say. No, 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 no. No, you've got administrative costs, and you've got a lot of HR costs in there, and, uh, you're, you know, you've got office supplies and subscriptions and insurance and, you know, the, the, the mortgage on the building, and those, are, those all seem so boring and not like ministry, right? I want to introduce you to somebody. This is Laverne, okay? Now, some of you may know Laverne if you've been around here a long time, but if you're new, and particularly if you don't ever come by during the week, you probably don't know Laverne. She's on our staff team. 
And Laverne works at our front desk right out in the atrium. And uh, she answers the phone. She serves as our receptionist during the week. She does some uh, administrative task for me. She sorts all the mail for all the rest of the staff and gets it to the right people. And she does a lot of behind-the-scenes work. Now, if you come in at any given moment during the week, you might see Laverne cutting out crafts for the children's ministry, for Mountaintop Kids. Because they will often hand her, because she's sitting there answering phones, and if she doesn't have letters to print or, or, or anything, you will find her, they'll, they'll send her, hey, can you cut out these hundred things? And you'll find her sitting at her desk while she's answering the phone back and forth, cutting out these crafts for the kids to use that coming Sunday. And friends, I want to tell you something. The subscription to our children's ministry that came up with that craft, the lease on the copy machine that printed it, the paper that's inside it, the scissors that she's using, Laverne's salary, the mortgage on the building she's sitting in, and the insurance on that building, and the HVA system that is keeping her cool or warm, depending on the crazy February Birmingham weather. All of it is part of the mission, because part of our mission is to make the gospel come alive for four, five, and six-year-olds who are doing a craft with their Bible lesson. And when and it finally clicks with that kid and they decide to ask Jesus into their heart and accept him as their Lord and Savior and spend their eternity with him and they get baptized and their mom has this awful looking sheep hanging on her fridge with glue on it and cotton balls barely hanging on but it was that ugly sheep that made it click for that four five or six year old that because the good shepherd Jesus came running after one sheep he came running after them too and that was why they decided to give their life to Jesus that is the mission. That is the mission. It's not cotton balls and insurance. It's a whole, it's a whole package that is designed to help kids find Jesus and teenagers find Jesus and adults find Jesus. That's what we do. And every dollar we spend is on that. That's who we are. We are the mission. The most important thing that we do for Birmingham is change more lives and Birmingham, and if we could get every kid to cut out a little sheep and find Jesus in Birmingham, we'd be doing something good. That was the whole point of the church, to change lives who will then in turn go change more lives. That was the whole point of the church. But they didn't quite get it at first. If you, uh, if you have a hard copy Bible, uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts. And depending on what edition you have, it may or may not have red words in it. Does anybody know what the red words are? Oh, what were those? Those are Jesus' words, right? The red words are Jesus' words. Now, some editions don't have that. I think the hard copies that we give away are just black and white. If you've got the Bible app open, um, it does the red words of Jesus. Now, does anybody know the last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, where they're found? They're not in... The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the typical places where we find the most things that Jesus said. The last words that are found before Jesus ascended into heaven after the resurrection are found in Acts chapter 1. Luke is the only Gospel writer who kind of wrote two editions. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, what we call it, the, the story of Jesus, and then he wrote the book of Acts, which is the story of the church. And it's in this scene in Acts 1, it's the only place that we kind of find Jesus kind of right before he ascends into heaven. He's with his disciples, and by this time, it's about six weeks after the resurrection. So Jesus, a lot of people think, don't know that Jesus hung around for a minute. About six weeks, he has seen about 500 people up to this point. So there are several people, and the disciples, there's kind of this mood in them where it's like, okay, now, you know, what now? What's going to happen now? Where, you know, what, what's up now? What, where are we going? What are we doing? And Jesus tells them, he says, I want you to gather together in Jerusalem. I want you to start in Jerusalem. And I'm going to send a gift to you. I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they're like, that sounds cool. We don't know what that is, but that sounds great. And then, after that, Jesus, right, then you're going to fix everything, right? 
Like then you're going to restore Israel to their proper place on the global power grid as a global power. You're going to kick you know what and take names later with the Roman Empire, right, Jesus? And he's like, yeah, the time for kicking whatever and taking names is not for you to worry about. That's for me. Remember, you just got one job. I want you to gather in Jerusalem. I want you to wait for this gift that I'm going to give you. And then I want you to listen really closely to what I tell you to do. So this is what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We're just going to read this one verse, and then we're going to go to a story in Acts 8 in just a minute. But you will receive power. You're going to have power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where I've told you to go and wait. And in all Judea, which was sort of the state of, the nation state, and in Samaria, the neighboring nation state, and to the very ends of the earth. Now, do you hear what Jesus says? My mission, my vision for you is to scatter and be my witnesses far beyond the walls of Jerusalem, which was a city literally with walls. They, if, you go to, if you've been to the Holy Land, it, lit, it still has walls around the city. I want you to start inside the walls, but I want you to get outside the walls. I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to go into all the neighboring communities and to the ends of the earth and be my witnesses that you know the living God and they can too. Witnesses that death has been defeated. Witnesses that mercy and grace abound. Witnesses that sins are forgiven. Witnesses that God so loved the world that he sent his son. Witnesses that whoever calls on the name on the Lord, believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth can be saved. I want you to be witnesses of the good news that you have heard and seen with your own two eyes. You are to be my witnesses. And it doesn't take any time. It doesn't hardly take any time, just a few days and what Jesus says, what happened, comes true. About 120 of the disciples are praying together on the day of Pentecost, a high and holy day in, Jewish, in their Jewish faith, about 50 days after Passover. And the Holy Spirit whew, comes over them. And People are amazed. People begin flocking to where they are because there is, there is power emanating from this place. And there's some kind of supernatural crazy things that happen where everyone can understand everyone. And so Peter's like, well, guess I should preach. So Peter gets up and preaches, and there are thousands around. And he preaches the very first Christian sermon. He has no prep time, no study retreat. Nothing. Very first Christian sermon. This is basically the gist of it. Yeah, Jesus was crucified. Some of you guys had a part in that. I'm not kind of naming names, but some of you guys had a part in that. But uh, he has resurrected, and we saw him with our own two eyes. So, and Acts says, Luke writes, that they were cut to the heart when they heard this. And they ask a question. They're like, what should we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And on that day, the first church became a mega church. On that day, Luke writes, 3,000 people repent of their sins. They, can, they go open confession and they're baptized and they join the church and it becomes this huge movement. And then Luke writes just right there, this is all like chapter two, it's just happened right after Jesus said it was gonna happen. It says daily, there were those added to their number every day. The movement was gathering momentum, and they're so excited. Just what Jesus said, they gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came. It's awesome. And you know what they do after that? They don't budge. You remember what Jesus said? That go into Jerusalem, to Judea, to some. No, they're like, Jerusalem's cool. Last well, enough. They don't budge. They stay right where they are. And it's almost as if they missed what Jesus said. The mission, though, the mission, though, is incomplete if it stays inside. 
You guys were supposed to go to not just Jerusalem, but to Judea, Samaria, and the very ends of the earth. You guys were supposed to get outside. It is incomplete if it stays in Jerusalem. And we're going to build an incredible facility for students, for, for kids. We're going to build more parking. We're going to invite people here. But I just want to tell you, if the only thing we do is build a building and change lives, and nothing happens with those changed lives, leave the building. This mission is incomplete. So we build a building for more people to come to. Now, predictably, the church becomes gridlocked in Jerusalem. They weren't all supposed to stay there. And eventually, there becomes tension in the city. They're persecuted. In fact, some young disciples are even killed for their faith. Many disciples are being arrested for their faith. It's literally illegal to be a Christian. So they, they scatter out of necessity. Of course, that's what God wanted for them all along. And in Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 4, it begins to tell a very short story of the scattering. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This is the whole point. Wherever they went, not that they would just gather in a church building or gather in a synagogue. The point is to preach it wherever they went. And the point for us is not to build a building so say we have a bunch of people coming. The point is to invite people into a life-giving relationship and equip them to share the message in their offices, in their neighborhoods, in their dinner clubs and sports teams and dorm rooms and classrooms and schools and pickleball groups and golf foursomes and movie friends and bridge clubs and country clubs and group techs and boardrooms and neighborhood parties. That's the whole point. Wherever they went, wherever you go this week. And then Luke tells the story of one kind of behind the scenes disciple. You don't hear much about Philip and his unique story about one city that we don't know the name of in Samaria. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. And proclaimed the Messiah there. Well, that was one of the places they're supposed to go. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Am I supposed to just go into staff meeting at, off, at the office and start preaching? Or am I supposed to go to the country club and be like, everybody listen up. Before you go out to your tea time, I have some preaching to do. The word here, some translations say preaching, but some say proclaim. It's, the word in Greek is keruso, and it means to publish, proclaim openly. I love this, proclaim openly something which has been done. I think what it means is that wherever we go, we are supposed to openly display to others what has been done in our lives. We're supposed, what's been done in you? To openly live out your faith. What if we went out and honored others above ourselves, forgave others because Christ forgave us, were kind and compassionate to people because Christ was kind and compassionate with us? What if we went out with an attitude to serve, not to be served, because we worship a Savior who came to serve, not be served, and give his life as a ransom for many? What if we just actually just like went out and just decided to, it's crazy, be Christian? I think like people would pay attention to what we said, I think people would go, hey, would you start a Bible study at our work? Something's different in you. And then listen to the next part. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Now don't get lost in this. Because you're like, I don't think I can pull that off, right? And listen, if you do the shrieks and the impure spirits, you're going to end up in HR, okay? <laughs> like, at your work. Like, there's probably going to be some discussions. But there are plenty of miracles that our world needs to see that are probably even more impactful. They need to see the miracle of radical love, hospitality, generosity, the miracle of being for others instead of against each other. And then this is the biggest miracle. This is the biggest miracle. Because they finally, though reluctantly scattered, something happens in that city that is astonishing. Something happens in that city 
that's never named. We don't know what it is. It's astonishing what happens in that city. So there was great joy in that city. When's the last time there was great joy when the Christians showed up in a city? Usually when the Christians show up, when we show up, people are worried there's going to be judgmentalism, there's going to be hypocriticals, uh, there's going to be political pandering, there's going to be guilt, fear mongering. When's the last time there was a Facebook like controversy or discussion and everybody's like, oh great, now the Christians are chiming in. When's the last time there was a Twitter war and all the Christians started commenting like, great, great joy on the Twitterverse because all the Christians are commenting now and they're blessing everyone or they're blessing everyone out. There's great joy. The purpose is that we would bring great joy. Luke says that joy came on the city because people saw the effects of the gospel on the people in the city. And for Birmingham is about bringing joy to a city because the gospel of Jesus Christ is touching people in tangible ways in everyday area of their lives. The most important thing we do for Birmingham is change more lives in Birmingham. The very best thing we do for Birmingham is equip a thousand people and send them out into the city. The most important thing we do for Birmingham is deploy a thousand disciples into the streets because our city needs to see lives who have been healed of addiction, marriages that have been healed of hurt, selfish people who have become selfless people, people who have a spirit of criticism, who all of a sudden get a spirit of encouragement, people who have had hearts of stone replaced with hearts of flesh. It's simple. The local church is the hope of the world because in the local church we are formed through community, passionate worship, fervent prayer, the proclamation of the word and, word and sent out into the city that so desperately needs the light of Jesus to shine in the darkest places. When I say at the end of the service, or whoever says it, let's be for Birmingham. That's what we mean. We don't mean go share a hashtag this week. We mean go share the love of Christ in the darkest place you find this week. Go be Jesus to somebody who can't find Jesus anywhere else but you. We are already a multi-campus church. Did you know that? You are our campus at your workplace. We have campuses in every public high school in the community. Did you know that? Students, you are our campus at Vestavia and Hoover and Oak Mountain and Mountain Brook and Homewood. You're our campus at Spain Park. You're our campus college students at UAB, at Samford, at Birmingham Southern. You're the campus in your neighborhood. You're the campus on your t-ball team and on your soccer team. That's what it means to be for Birmingham. Let's go change the world and bring joy to a city. That's our hope. That's our prayer. That's our vision. Not that we would put up a bunch of bricks for people to come to, but that we would invite people into all of these bricks so that we would be a people sent from. That's it. And I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you into something so much bigger than all of us. I'm inviting you to give to something, sacrifice to something that, is, that will outlive us. I'm inviting you to, to, to surrender to something that will touch people's lives that you may never meet because you're going to reach somebody that comes here that goes and touches somebody in another workplace, in another community, in another neighborhood who may never attend Mountaintop, but they were touched by the light of Christ that they found here. I'm asking you to give to something that will outlive you. Some of us will never see the end results of the families that are reached, the teenagers that are reached, the single people that are reached, the individuals that are reached in this place. It will far outlast us because it's bigger than us. But here, So here's the question I want you to just ask. Will I allow my fruit to grow on someone else's tree? Will I allow my fruit? Will I give Will I plant something in the ground to reach another Jim Saya, to reach another workplace, another school, 
another neighborhood of people that I may never know or meet. I believe this. You are a great church. It is the honor of my ministry to be your pastor. You are already transforming the city. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced that if we reach one more person for every one person here, if we lay down our lives and leave a legacy for Birmingham, for Vestavia, for Hoover, for Homewood, for Mountain Brook, for Bessemer, for Calera, for Pelham, for Alabaster, for Chelsea, for Helena, for the UAB campus, for the Samford campus, for Irondale, for Crestwood, for every little nook and cranny of this incredible magic city. We might just change the world. For Jerusalem, for Samaria, for Judea, for Jefferson County, Shelby County, and for Sweet Home Alabama and to the very ends of the earth. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to be a part of something so big. We are praying that you would help us understand our call to be a part of something that will outlive us, something that will transform people we've never met. Give us your heart for our city and for the very ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. When you leave today, you're going to get something, a little bag. It's got a little jar with some seeds in it. And here's what I want you to do. It's one per household. We don't have one for everybody. One for house, per household. And I want, it's got some seeds for a camellia plant. It's a state flower of Alabama. Do you know that? I want you to plant it somewhere in your yard. And I want you to take some dirt from your backyard, from your college campus. And I want you to bring it back. We're going to have a label next week for you to put it in our R for your part of town. And as you watch this grow, I want you to remember that you're going to move out of that house one day. You're planting something for someone else to enjoy. And you bring that dirt back, I want you to remember that you're bringing part of your campus back here to remember that that's your role, that you have a role on the dirt that you live on to be the campus of the church of Jesus Christ in your neighborhood. Because Jesus isn't just for 225 Centerview Drive. He is for our whole city and the ends of the earth. We're going to close with a song called King of Kings. It's the story of Jesus. But the story of Jesus includes the story of the church. And there's a line in this thing that always gives me chills when it says, the church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old will not fade. It ain't going to fade with me. And I don't think you want it to fade with you. Let's stand and sing.